Okay, hello everyone and, and uh, welcome to today's uh, online event hosted by the International Inequalities Institute here at the LSE. I'm Chico Ferreira uh, and I'll be the chair today. I'm delighted to be chairing uh, today's event, which is entitled Inequality and the Differentiation of Capital, the Scientific Project of Political Economy, uh, which is a lecture by Professor Facundo Alvaredo. Facundo needs very little introduction. He's a professor at the Paris School of Economics and at the École d'Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He's a co-director of the World Inequality uh, Database and of the World Inequality Lab. His research is focused in the fields of public economics, the inequality of income and wealth, and the economic history of capitalism. And I am particularly pleased on this occasion to welcome Facundo in to his new role as a part-time professorial research fellow with the International Inequalities Institute at the LSE. We are just absolutely delighted that Facundo will be spending part of his time with us in London. And this is in a sense, his kind of welcome uh, inaugural uh, uh, lecture in that, in that role. Uh, just before I hand over to Facundo, let me just make three quick points of uh, practicalities here. Uh, please note that we do have a captioner for today's event. If you want to activate the caption, uh, please uh, click the CC button. There should be a CC button uh, somewhere on your screen, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and you can also access larger captions by using the link that's been posted in the chat box. Um, the event uh, will run for an hour and 15 minutes from, if you're in London, from 1 p.m. to 2.15 p.m. Uh, Facundo will talk for, you know, 40 to 50 minutes, and then there'll be a chance for, for questions in, in the final 20, 25 minutes of the event. If you uh, want to ask any questions, please use, this is unfortunately a webinar event, so please use the Q&A uh, box uh, to ask questions, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, read those out and, and select them. So Facundo doesn't have to worry about reading the q and I'll, I'll do that. Um, last thing, our next III public event is entitled Mountain Tales, Love and Loss in the Municipality of Castaway Belongings, which is a beautiful book actually. And it will take place at 5 p.m. on Thursday, the 2nd of December. There's more information at the website. Uh, with that, and without further ado, a uh, great pleasure to hand it over to Facundo. Uh, well, uh, so I assume that you can hear me well. Um, yes, yes, we can. So, uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you very much, Chico Ferreira and the organizers for the invitation to this talk at the International Inequalities Institute. I regret very much that this presentation cannot be in person, nor that I am wonderful at in-person presentations, which I am not, but I fear that I am not very good at Zoom talks either, where I cannot make eye contact with you. I have no idea of the identities of the, of the people in the audience. So this, this makes things much more difficult. I always get lots of information from the blinking of eyes in the audience. Zoom, these webinars are most like are mostly like being in a TV set where I can, I, I, and I can tell you something. I was in a TV set once many years ago and I promised myself I should not come back. Uh, so th that, that's a pity, and I hope that the next time will be in person. So I have first a number of initial warnings. Uh, first, well, this is not a lecture. I don't lecture about anybody about anything. Uh, second, I, I don't lie to you if I tell you that at the start I fear the risks that I am taking with this talk, and I fear that at the end of the talk I will think to myself, I, I would have been better off showing everybody a couple of plots with uh, top income shares or top, top wealth shares, saying to ourselves, oh, what a terrible situation this is, brothers and sisters, let's tax, let's unredistribute. But I will not, I will not do that today. 
Third, uh, this is not about the presentation of a paper either. We know the rules of the profession and how the presentation of the paper and the paper itself to be successful must stress the supposed contributions, must be very well delimited, and at the same time must omit or hide as much as possible the problems uh, in it. So I am not very professional at that uh, either, and even worse, I have no intention to become very professional uh, in, in those dimensions. And this is not about the, present the standard presentation of the paper. My goal today is quite different. And in many ways, it's quite the opposite. I want to talk to you about a project, a scientific project started more than 200 years ago, which is living but dormant. And this project about which you certainly know something or you may know many things, is the scientific project of political economy. If you want, although this is not totally correct, the scientific project of classical political economy. This project, the project of political economy as a scientific discipline, imposed on itself the responsibility, the goal and the obligation to understand and explain capitalist society in the context of a general theory, because it couldn't have been otherwise. And, and, and let me, not to be clear, but uh, to be explicit, let me repeat this because it's at the core of the argument. The project of political economy, the scientific project of political economy imposed on itself the responsibility, the goal and the obligation to understand and explain capitalist society in the context of a general theory. Uh, I am not going to say anything new. Let me be also crystal clear about that. There is nothing original in my talk and I have no intention of faking originality for I am in great company of the greatest authors of, of the project. You know that when we talk about political, classical political economy, there are a number of authors involved and Three stand out, who are uh, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx. But my presentation, my talk today, is not about individual scholars or individual authors. It's about the project. So you will see that they will not cite many people. And you may ask why this guy want to talk about political economy or the scientific project of political economy. You may conclude quickly that uh, this would be a talk about the past, past, old, historical economic thinking, the Ricardian, the Ricardian functional distribution of income. And you may conclude also that I have decided to, migra to migrate from distribution studies, to, from the field of distribution studies in which I have been for a number of years to the field of the history of economic doctrines. No, this is not the case. This is about the present. This is about inequality. This is about understanding inequalities, but today it's not about answers. It's about a path. It's about a project that was abandoned, a project that was on the right track and must be recovered and retaken. Without it, we cannot do without it. My position, of course, I will not have the time. The, the, the talk is very short. I will not have the time to fully argue or even convince you about 200 years of uh, economic thinking development. But this should be, at least it should sound more or less quite self-evident to all of you. In economics, as in all other social disciplines, no matter if you like it or not, we have abandoned, for reasons that still have to be explained, we have abandoned the responsibility to think in terms of a general theory. And what we have is a myriad, a multiplicity of uh, partial doctrines. And the development of a partial doctrine may serve the purpose of becoming uh, professionally very successful. And we know that. But this way of, for the discipline to proceed has left us in the state in which we are. In my view, you may think otherwise. We are unable to understand the present and the past from the proper framework. And this is even more evident in the case of inequality studies. So this is my position. Only in the context of a general theory 
that develops without compromises and without constraints. And to seek and that seeks to understand uh, and explain capitalism, we can keep the hope to understand the inequalities we observe. Otherwise, we are like Oedipus. I, I, I don't know how you feel, but this is how I feel. We, we, otherwise, we remain as we are today, like Oedipus, or if you want a more popular recent example, we are like Bruce Willis in the film, The Sixth Sense. I don't know, here I cannot see your faces, so I don't know if you have watched the movie or not, but in The Sixth Sense, I can tell you, uh, Bruce Willis spends the whole film unable to understand what he says until the very end. Yet, even if he does not understand what he says, this doesn't stop him from drawing conclusions, most of the time wrong conclusions. And this doesn't uh, prevent him from taking actions with very good intentions, but he's unable to understand what we say, and we should feel ourselves in a very similar situation. In general, and in particular, uh, in the case of, uh, in the field of inequality studies. As Bruce Willis or Oedipus, I think, unfortunately, very unfortunately, we see inequalities, we measure inequalities, I, and I want to be explicit and clear, we have excelled in developing instruments and data and measurement techniques and capabilities to describe top income, well shared, poverty lines, coefficients, uh, synthetic indexes, etc. But we do not properly interpret, we cannot properly interpret to understand what we observe without a general theory. Without the general theory that develops the three central concepts of economic thinking that I can remind you that are commodity, money, and capital. And if the theories can proceed to be further developed, we should add three other fundamental concepts to economic thinking, which will be the state, power, and history. It is a fact that the political economy project in the 19th century was on that track, but it was replaced, it was abandoned. Some of the reasons we know, then it was around, abandoned for ideological reasons, it was abandoned because the project had reached very, very nasty conclusions about exploitations, and we don't want to leave. Those very nasty conclusions uh, reached not by Marx, but even by Ricardo, would make very difficult for some of us to get up every morning and go to work. But the fact is that the project was abandoned and replaced, replaced by something that did not keep up the obligation and did not keep up the challenge. Let me put you five examples of the orphanhood, uh, which I feel and which you should feel. Example number one, there is an increasing agreement that there should be more taxation and redistribution. This is one of the light motifs of the public discussion. Of course, there are pros and cons, and there are people in agreement, people in disagreement, but there is, I should say, an increase in agreement on this. But this is not a new scientific discovery. We cannot be fooled by the state of the discussion. Robin Hood knew about redistribution at that level. We can even say that Robin Hood knew much, almost everything about redistribution and many before him. But as in, an, in our very limited scientific horizon, and we, I will try to argue why, we treat inequalities almost exclusively, almost purely statistically, because incomes are considered physical flows, wealth and capital are physical objects attached to some uh, rules of private property. Even the, this focus on the statistical thinking about inequalities, it is not surprising that the conclusion you reach easily in a very Newtonian way, in a very classical mechanical way, is that you want to change the shape of the distribution. And this is statistically possible on all its happiness. That's all. The, the thing is just change the shape of the distribution by some, in some way that we will discuss later. But is this it? Can this be it? 
can we fool ourselves with that idea? Doesn't, sound, that, doesn't this sound closer to the magic primitive thinking? In the context from, from the context of the theory in which we are looking at the problem. Example number two, who is going to change the shape of the distribution? A plumber or a set of plumber who will design properly evaluated policies that should address outcomes or results or both. This is immaterial. The discussion between outcome and opportunities is part of the problems of the, of the underlying theory. So those are the scholars who conceive economic science in a Marshallian fashion as an engine to solve the problems of the machine. The system as a machine is considered to work pretty well. The forces of competition have produced phenomenal innovation, phenomenal wealth growth, and uh, material, uh, uh, well, uh, material wealthness. So the general idea is that we need to keep to protect the forces of competition and produce some kind of redistribution without affecting those forces. Uh, those have to be protected and the system works pretty well and those are just small misfunctionings that the plumber will come and know how to fix or at least we will try to fix. But is this it? Again, doesn't the notion of taxation and redistribution like that, doesn't it sound a bit like the master machine, magician of a primitive community promising the rain after some manipulation. Uh, example number three. Once the plumbers have designed those properly evaluated policies, they will pass them on to the public sector, where they will, there will be a democratic discussion and the necessary laws will be passed in parliament. Otherwise said, otherwise said, we expect uh, the redistribution to, call, to, to come from something that we call the state. And we stick to the illusion of the state. This, this illusion comes from enlightenment thinking. The illusion of the state separated from civil society. Civil society is selfishness and profit and evil. And then the state is the sphere of public good and general interest, uh, which will and we can and should tame capital, foster development and uh, arrange uh, the forces to generate a more a fair uh, society. But is that what the capitalist state as a historical object is? Where does this come, this idea, where, where does this come from, from the theory which we have? Fourth, all this process that I have just described and it's on the center of the discussion deal always start with the nation, with the nation state or with groups of nations, of course, right? Because we have the nation there. We believe that we are forced to take them as given, but are we? And uh, finally, the fifth, when we need, we want, when the field, and I'm speaking from the field of inequality, so I'm not innocent here, I'm just expressing my satisfaction. When we want to turn to explanations, the literature is forced to restrict itself to the identification of what we call determinants of inequality. Returns to education, terms of trade, export and imports, governmental, governmental policies, taxation, pensions, but none of these are explanations. In so far as we have no theory with it, which has tell, told us that those are exogenous elements. As soon as we leave the, I don't know, the Marshallian thinking, the Marshallian par partial equilibrium setting, those are not explanations of inequality. Those are no determinants, even if we uh, accept the assumptions for which we decide to call them determinants. So, it may be the case that many of you, or most of you, are satisfied and happy with this explanation provided so far and for the calling for policy implications and policy measures based on those explanations. Uh, I understand you. This is the sign of our times. You may be, and we are surrounded by people of action. You need, you need to, to act, uh, but, uh, 
uh, I, I disagree. I disagree as long as we don't have the proper framework to understand uh, what we observe, uh, that uh, this is the, the right path uh, to follow. There is a good reason for our inability to grasp inequality in my understanding is that the, the sphere in which we live, or the doctrine, better said, the doctrine in which we live, as powerful as it is uh, to study and to understand the market, cannot and will not, it's not its, in, its intention, it is, right, it, it is right in doing so, it won't go beyond markets. And inequality is one of the examples where the limitation makes itself evident. Observe inequality is the result of interaction between the market, the reproduction system, and the production system. And we should not blame neoclassical economics for being unable to provide us the tools you want to understand conceptually inequality. Statistically, I'm not talking about statistical parts. Statistically, we have excelled, as I said. Conceptually, we lack the theory. And blaming neoclassical economics is like blaming a fridge for being unfit to cook a meal because neoclassical economic studies the market and inequality is not entirely determined in the market. So nothing or very little in these five examples, nothing or very little in these five examples is based on the most advanced understanding of capitalism that we had at our disposal. And this is fortunately or unfortunately political economy thinking of the 19th century. And I say fortunately and unfortunately, it is, it is fortunately because, well, we don't have to restart from scratch. There was a project, the project was abandoned, the project had made phenomenal progress, we must say, it restarted seriously in the understanding of the concept of commodity, the concept of money, and the concept of capital. In that sense, this, the, the situation is fortunate. It is unfortunate or sad because we are late uh, 150 years and we should restart. But I want also to be clear on this. I, we do not have to start from scratch. This is usually what the, the position of some of the so-called heterodox economists or the heterodox economics that they reject everything, everything of the past and neoclassical theory is rejected and they, they want to start from a scratch. No, uh, the position, my, my, uh, the argument here is that will be that each of the fundamental theories of economic thinking are uh, uh, necessary moments of, of, of the development of things. So let me now share the screen. And, and it's a really, it's a pity for me not to be able to interact with you because I know at least the, the talk would have been different and I will share so I guess now you can see my screen yep and uh, Uh, and uh, the, uh, I, I will. Uh, I only have a couple of, of in this very uh, unusual presentation with no plots. I have only two slides. And for this, so uh, let me summarize, or trying to explain very briefly, completely, and unsuccessfully the framework from which I would like to talk to you. And as again, I said, there is anything original in my talk, I will use the, the work and the research of a professor of the University of Buenos Aires that unfortunately passed away very recently, Pablo Levin, the, who over many years of work and discussion with his students developed this framework for economic science. Of course, this is my interpretation of the framework with my errors, my mistakes and my limitations. And I should say that we are working on this uh, uh, to make progress on this interpretation with two colleagues, Ingrid Blainat from King's College and Pilar Pique from the University of Buenos Aires and many others, uh, younger scholars from, from, from several institutions. So let's, let's see if I can transmit at least a part of what I, I would like to transmit. Let me use 
a metaphor. I will use a geometric metaphor just to simplify, to make a presentation of political economy thinking, of a new interpretation, if you want, of political economy thinking and why this is relevant now. I will use a, me a geometric metaphor, metaphor composed of four spheres. I ask you to see there uh, four spheres of different sizes. Where the smallest sphere is enclosed in the second sphere, the second sphere is enclosed in the third sphere, and the third sphere is enclosed in the largest sphere. And let me let me begin by the with the largest sphere, where I would like to represent economic science in general, define as the study of the economic structures and relations in human societies, whatever their degree of historical development. So if you want to study the economic relations and structure of the Roman Empire, you are in economic science. The Greek Empire, you are in economic science. The Egyptian Empire, you are in economic science. And the caves of the prehistory man, you are in economic science. But one stage of economic science is specialized in one particular development, capitalism. The stage of economic science specialized in capitalism is called political economy. And this political economy is represented by the second sphere. And here we must say that political economy is composed, and this is part of the framework, political economy is composed by three and only three general theories. Which here is represented by T1, T2, and T3, or theory one, theory two, and theory two. This is something that, that creates me, creates a lot of problems with me in discussion with the students when I say political economy is composed by three and by a sequence of three and only three general theories in a non chronological way. First problem, people usually say, why only three theories? Yes, I'm sorry, I cannot, I don't have the time to convince you about that, but there, there are no other general theories in, econ in political economy. We have only three general theories. In the same way that in the study of the universe, we have Newtonian theory and Einstein general relativity theory. In, economy, in political economy, there are only three, and you cannot find, you will not be able to find a fourth one. There is no. What we have is an enormous amount of doctrines, partial doctrines, related to these general theories. You have mercantilism, physiocracy, the economic thinking of the Catholic Church, you have Keynesianism, you have uh, neoclassical doctrines, you have quantity theory, uh, anti-quantity theory, etc., etc. All, all those are doctrines, doctrines related to the, these three general theories and only three general theories. And when I say this, uh, this sequence is non-chronological, this, this, this goes against the general belief that uh, the progress in knowledge and in science is linear and chronological. Well, it is not. Uh, the study of the market studied, uh, started in the late Middle Ages, and the most advanced stage of the study of the market is neoclassical economics. Political economy and the study of the reproduction system is a development of the Enlightenment and the 18th and the 19th century. This goes after the beginning of, of the study of the market and also before neoclassical economics. So progress in these three general theories is not chronological, it's conceptual. And for this conceptual progress, we need to go back and forth in time, all the time. The three theories are related as Einstein, I, I, I have added the, the third a, a sentence by Einstein at the bottom of the slide. Einstein said, the most, beautiful, the most beautiful fate of a physical theory is to point the way to the establishment of a more inclusive theory in which it lives on as a limiting case. Well, this is exactly the relationship of these three general theories of political economy. The development of a theory, the failure of the, the fate of every theory is to fail, and the failure of the theory gives rise to the second theory, in which the first one 
leaves as a limiting case. Let me go very quickly on this and these three general theories. Each theory has, as a general theory, a general law. And the four, we need a, a name for, we need a title for this theory just for naming purposes. And we call T1, and this is the name chosen by Levin, catalactics. But again, if you want to understand catalactics or what I mean by catalactics, you just think in terms of neoclassical doctrine. It's the study of the market and just the market, which is not a small matter, not a small matter. But for the study of the market, you can think in terms of the Edgeworth box or everything you know about valuation, general equilibrium and uh, the welfare theorem, theorems, et cetera, et cetera. The, 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 this theory, this arrangement has very um, com, basic uh, assumptions. All members of the society have one kind, only one kind of social relationship. And this, social rela this generalized social relationship is through the exchange of commodities in the market. And the market is a conjunction of free wills through a contract in which no party can impose a condition. This is behind our general thinking because this is the dominant neoclassical doctrine in which we live and we, which develop. All the rest are in a way, when, when somebody doesn't like the assumptions of neoclassical thinking, in, what they come up with are with exceptions or special cases or contradictions to the basic principles. But the basic theory is that one and dominates. We are not only equal in front of the state from the enlightenment principles, we are also equal in the market when we bring to the market our commodities and the market is a conjunction of free wills. There is no power, exchange is an exchange on equal terms between equals and between commodities which are equivalent. Catalactics as such, as we, you know that, has a general law. Each theory, each general theory has a general law and this is the law of market adjustment. The second theory, and I cannot go through how to, what's the case to argue that the, the movement from theory one to theory two, but theory two is, related if you want and if you want to understand and simply what I'd like to mean is exactly mostly Smith, Ricardo and Marx and the sphere of material reproduction. Abstract political economy has uh, also a general law, it's the law of value and has uh, <laughs> an idea or a notion of money, an idea and a notion of capital. And then the third we, where we are in this concept today, or where we were at the end of the 19th century, not now, at the end of the 19th century, when the political economy project is abandoned, we are in the limit between the second and the third sphere, in the movement or in the attempt to um, pass, to go from the T2 to T3, and this, progress, this, this moment of scientific progress is, is expressed, is present in, in, in chapter one of Marx Das Kapital, but we are not going to discuss this now. The third general theory that we call concrete uh, political economy, which is broadly the scientific discipline to study, that studies capitalism, has sold to a general law that we want to call it the law of historical transformation of the system. But these three theories, and some of you may believe that I am a bit uh, crazy, but uh, after, after, uh, after moments of reflection, you see that all your economic knowledge fits perfectly in this framework. Each of these theories have developed in a way, in, in their way, the three concepts, uh, the, the three main concepts of uh, um, economic thinking, commodity, money, and capital. So there you, we have nine concepts. We have no intention, I have no intention, I have no time to go through the three concepts of commodity, money, and capital of the three theories. But as our main interest and focus now 
is, and today is inequality, we need by force at least to focus on the evolution of the concept of capital. And I will not be very detailed, but just take, let's take a few moments to reflect what we understand by capital so far in the theory we have at hand. And you recognize yourself and you should recognize uh, all the knowledge about capital, uh, mainstream economics, uh, rightly has uh, about capital. Capital companies, we have capital companies. Uh, capital companies, uh, capital is for this, for T1, for, for, for catalactics or for neoclassical economics, capital is a physical object. It's just it's a collection of physical uh, elements uh, of commodities. Capital companies compete between themselves. And in this competition, with market competition rules, in this competition, uh, the fate of uh, capital companies is uh, to either uh, to the equalization of the rates of profit. This is what's behind all the economic theory we study. Capital is mostly considered to be a physical element. And this is the way we measure it in our inequality studies when we do top income, top shares of uh, wealth or private property. That we believe that we can measure this because we can put price on this. And you know that there is a long tradition of discussion between the Cambridge and Cambridge, wrong discussion. Uh, and, and debates about the concept of capital. But the main feature that I would like to uh, stress today is that our conception of capital is related for theory one in a, in, in a collection of physical elements. In theory two, after political economy, you know that perfectly, the, the conflict between uh, way, uh, capital and labor in the Political economic tradition, capital is a social relationship. Yet, even in the political economic tradition of capital as a social relationship, capitals are qualitatively equal, but quantitatively different. There is no, that's why we can make our estimates, either in T1 and T2, in K1 and T2. We have a concept of capitals where capitals are qualitatively equal, and that's why they compete, and that's why the rates of profit can converge, and the, the fundamental assumption of competition, this is an assumption, it's not a result, the, 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 prof, the rates of profit will converge, but the capitals are qualitatively different, Quanti sorry, quantitatively different, and in this conception of uh, uh, Quantitatively different, we based mainly our understanding uh, of inequality, even if we move from the functional distribution of income or wealth to the personal distribution of income or wealth. I, I don't know if I can be uh, explicit enough on the consequence of this. This is not a result. This is an assumption of the theory with which we have been working for a hundred years. Capitals are quantitatively different, but qualitatively equal. That's why they compete, and that's why we can, um, we can assume that there is a tendency for the rates of profits to equalize, or there is an equalization of the rates of profits in all the models of uh, micro and macroeconomics that you have always ever studied. You have always an equalization of the rates of profit. If it is not an equalization, if it is because you have introduced some misfunctioning of the system. Oh yes, you have introduced monopolies, you have introduced oligopolies, you have rent capturing behavior, et cetera, et cetera. But all of them are not at the basic and the foundations of the theory. Those are misfunctionings of the theory, misfunctioning of the system is not the general case. The general case is for the equalization of the rates of profits for capitals that are, I'm sorry if I am repetitive, qualitatively equal. The movement, I, uh, of course I am not developing the, the, the whole argument here, but the movement from, the, the, this represents capital 
the concept of capital for T1, for catalactics, neoclassical economics, as, but two, for abstract political economy. Marx, to put an extreme example, when Marx told the Germans, the only thing you need to do is to wait for Germany to become London. And when Marx said to the Indians, oh, New Delhi will become London one day, Marx had in mind this idea of qualitatively equal capital that will spread through the world with equalization of the profit rates, making the world a rather homogeneous system. This is the general theory also that Marx had uh, in mind. The problem is that we cannot keep with that assumption anymore. And this Marx or characterized one of the features of the movement between theory one and theory three. And uh, I'm sorry, this is not moving properly. I would like to put an example of why we should, our theoretical work in general in economics or in economic thinking and in inequality studies should abandon and what would be the consequences of abandoning this heavy assumption of, uh, of what we call undifferentiated capital. Again, in neoclassical economics and in abstract political economy, in Smith, in Ricardo, and Marx, in all the classical political economy thinkers, the dominant thinking is the concept of undifferentiated capital, capital that are equal and uncompete. And to mark the fact that we should abandon this undifferentiation idea, this notion of undifferentiation that dominates us and keeps dominating our models and our thinking and the policy recommendations we make. Uh, I can put as an example, the example of the production, the global production of food uh, with the case of soy production, not because I am Argentinian and Argentina is one of the leading products producers of, of soy. It's because this is part of most, one of the most relevant parts of the, of the global production of food. Let's summarize quickly with this case. 80 years ago, seeds were quasi-public goods. That is, they, they were available for successive uses without payment. So a person to a rich landowner, producer of wheat or soy, could use the seeds of previous um, years for the following years without payment. So this is what we mean, but what is meant by quasi public goods and improvements and adaptation of these goods were made uh, by producers or by the public sector. We know very well that in most of these commodity producer countries, there was or there still is some institute of technological or agricultural innovation and techniques, etc., etc. in France, in Argentina, in the United States. The public sector, which cannot again be understood as, a, as a, an entity outside the, the civil society and the economic system, played a role in helping producing in the adaptation and the improvement of seeds as a quasi public good. And the last decades, and we know this very well, uh, we saw the emergence of hybrid seeds. And one of the characteristics of their hybrid seeds is that they lose. Uh, specific characteristics in the second generation. Uh, so the producer has to purchase the, the, the hybrid seeds every year, uh, given that the, the genetic changes are only accessible to a handful of them. So the, the case was posed, who is the owner of the seed now? And this was the, this was the result of the situation is now is the, res the result of the historical development. Uh, I think that the first case uh, is, was presented at the court, at the court in, in the United States, the case Diamond Chakrabati versus Chakrabati, where they, the, the, court, the American court permitted the patent of a bacterium. It was the first antecedent of, of this discussion. And finally, 
In 2000, the US Supreme Court confirmed the possibility of granting a patent to a plant. The genes, the tissues, the new plants, and the seeds. And as a result of this allocation of uh, rights, of private uh, property rights, there are only four gene giants that control over 70% 70, over 70 of the world seed market. Came China, Bayer Monsanto, Dow DuPont, and Buff. A couple of years ago, when I made similar presentations, there were already six. Monsanto, Bayer, Buff, Syngenta, Dow, and DuPont, but now they, they have been matched. They control 82% of the seeds. No, they, they have 82% of the seeds have patents, and these four companies control 85% of the patents. From this, you usually see in public discussion an obsession with the control of patents. Should patents be abolished, et cetera, et cetera. Please, this is not my point. My point is the following. These firms, which have monopolized in a way, have control of the production of innovations generated and produced in the production of uh, hybrid seeds, write additional contracts with producers. These firms, uh, and, and we know very, this very well because we know the discussions and the complaints of rich and poor producers in rich and poor and developing countries, the problems of the, pro of the relationships of the agricultural producers, no matter how rich or poor they are, with respect to these companies are present in Argentina, in Brazil, in South Africa, in Australia, New Zealand, United States, etc. So these firms write addition contract, addition contract with producers. They establish what to produce, where to produce, who the local provide, seed provider is, which the exporting company will be, which the local transportation company will be. These companies do not own that they don't need to own land. They don't need to know most of the infrastructure capital, physical capital, if you want, in order for the decisions to be decided at the level of, 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 the, of the gene giants. So you may have, what, what we have is a number of producers, in this case of agricultural producers that may be rich or poor. This is, this is up to our statistical description of, uh, of uh, asset inequality or private property inequality. But these rich or poor asset owners have no decisions of the economic actions which they are forced to take. This is decided if, if you think of this system as an economic hierarchy, this is everything or most of the decisions are decided at the top of the hierarchy. It is not, uh, it, is, it shouldn't be surprises in the context if you think that, for instance, the most important uh, rental cars company today own no cars. The most important uh, home rental companies or rooms or home rental company owns no hotels or apartments. It shouldn't be surprised in this context, for instance, that Pfizer, when selling vaccines to developing countries, decided which the, transport the transportation company was going to be. Even if I, there was a case, again, I can cite the case of Argentina, when Argentina wanted to buy Pfizer vaccines and Make the, transport those vaccines with the national airlines. Pfizer said, "No, no, this, the vaccines will be transported by DHL, not because Pfizer owns DHL at all. No, but in, it is it, it is a fact that we need to accept and acknowledge is that the way decisions, uh, are, the place where decisions are decided, are not at the level of the ownership of." capital, as we keep fixing to believing to understand, but at a level where the ownership of physical capital is not necessary and is not required, and it's even worse, is not profitable. So, the, and 
uh, they are they are most extreme uh, cases that you won't consider you would like to consider in the context when sometimes you listen I, 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 this may sound a bit reactionary but it is certainly not you may consider the local provider of monsanto or whatever company sits in a given country suppose that this is a monopoly monopoly and uh, the owner of the monopoly provider of seats who receives the seats from Monsanto is a rich, wealthy company. It's a rich, wealthy company which is absolutely at the expense of the decisions of Monsanto because the very moment when Monsanto decides to replace him or her from another provider, his or her capital loses all its value. All the stress is put. So when you see this rich, capital owners to complain to national governments because any increase in the rates of taxation will uh, have an enormous impact of their profit rates. Well, in the context of an outdated economic theory, you may not understand those claims. In the context of a theory where you accept that capital is not undifferentiated, by ca but capital is differentiated, and cannot be considered to be the same thing, the capital owned by the local seed provider than the capital owned by Monsanto, you cannot think of a taxation strategy treating the same two capitals just, be, just because they are quantitatively equal. No, we have a problem in our, for instance, in our thinking, the, the idea that capital is undifferentiated and that ownership quantity is not or may not if you want given that i am not developing the whole argument i may not be convincing you let's say that if we are led to believe that quantity is not or may not be the main variable um, to be considered but quality but the nature and the characteristics of capital in, in the context of a social relationship, we cannot, we should stop uh, thinking of a inequality individual or in terms of uh, distribution of capital, et cetera, as a quantitative term, in, in quantitative terms only. Because exactly, otherwise we, it is impossible to understand the claims we observe sometimes by rich, asset owners that do not control the profit rate they have. And this is one of the claims. They do not control the profit rate they have. It is not only the conflict identified by classical political economy thinking between capital and labor. This was the central part of an outdated classical political economy, the conflict between capital and labor. And this is why the functional distribution of income was the Ricardian idea that sometimes is mentioned when uh, authors and scholars want to want to recall capital political economy thinking. Well, it is not only that. It, we should only we should all also consider that from the con from the development, the conceptual development of the concept of capital, the conceptual development of capital, there is something that emerges from the concept of capital, with, which is power. But not power in the case of the neoclassical political economy thinking. No, it's the concept of power derived in, intrinsically from the concept of capital. And it is not only power from capital to labor, it is also the construction of hierarchies within structures of capital, where, well, your physical capital is, you may be very rich, but is not the main variable to look at, or is not the main variable to understand in terms of the general theory. Well, because you have the control and power, which are not determined in terms of quantities, but in terms of qualities. And we could go on saying, well, where, where does those qualities stem? Where, where does this qualitative power stem from? And we should get into the idea of the production of innovations in, in capitalism. But for the moment, what if I had a goal, a limited goal, and knowing that the, the, the time is scarce and I'm not able to develop the whole argument, 
the main, not the message, but the main question I would ask you to ask yourself is this, the, uh, or the main exercise I would ask you to make is this departure from the idea of capitals are being qualitatively equal and quantitatively different. When you think about capitals are qualitatively different, capitals having more power once over the others because of characteristics and conditions that we are not discussing today now, well, the whole place, the, the, the whole game should change. The whole game should change. And this, fix, and, and this is why, um, perhaps I'm sorry to say this, but this is why many times when we see the, this the series on top wealth shares, and we see that top wealth shares in a number of countries do not go up so fast or so high as we expect. And sometimes the usual answer to this lack of uh, increasing rates is, oh, this, 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 this comes from defective data. I am sure that uh, top wealth shares must be much higher. So this, this is a problem of the data. It may not be the case. We can be very well living in a world where top wealth shares, as we physically and quantitatively measure them, are not so high. We may not be going back to the structure of property as in the 19th century. Assets, as we measure them, can be much more redistributed as Uber with cars or Airbnb with apartments or Pfizer with transportation machines. And yet the control and the extraction and the generation of the profit rates is very concentrated. So perhaps we need to move from this obsession with the quantitative measurement and determination, as useful as it is, of course, I'm not saying that we don't, we don't need to measure. The problem is how to interpret, interpret what we see. We do not need to see increase in top wealth shares to have an increase, an increasing concentration of economic power determined by the rules of capital through a concept of capital that the theory we have is not provided. And this is, uh, I guess, all I wanted to say. Brilliant. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. This was uh, certainly different uh, and very interesting. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but let me start with some of with one of the questions that we already have. And if other people have questions, you can type them in the Q and A. But let me first of all uh, read a question from Christian Tilsher. Facundo it says, "Congratulations on your very inspiring talk." I do like your soy example. Being a physician, I always had the impression that it is misleading to study, quote, quote, unquote, the market. It is as if you study, quote, unquote, inflammation. This doesn't yield much. You need to study, for example, acute pancreatitis, myocarditis, pneumonia, etc. Transfer to economics, it seems to me that there are very different markets, commodities and consumers and so on and that we should study real specific economical subjects rather than unreal abstract definitions such as neoclassical utility function that aims at representing the standard consumer. Would you agree? We, we do uh, each one by one. Yes, uh, I, I agree and disagree at the same time. <laughs> because uh, no, as a physician, I mean, I mean a physician, we need theory. We absolutely need theory. And I, I, I didn't want to transmit the idea that neoclassical economics as a doctrine is useless as the orthodox economics usually say. No, the three theories I wanted to present very briefly, even if it was incomplete, uh, perhaps unsuccessfully, are described as three necessary moments of the development of economic thinking. In a way, studying the market is what it is necessary. At the moment, the theory reveals that it is insufficient and you need to move to the following stage, which is the reproduction system. At the moment, that revealed that it is insufficient and you move to the production sphere. But studying the market and having models is both uh, uh, are necessary moments of, of the development of economic thinking, uh, for sure. It's, it's, it's not that... Uh, uh, the standard market is unnecessary. I, want, I, I don't want to. I don't want to, this idea to be uh, 
mis, mis, in, misinterpreted. Uh, it's, the, the case of it, it is always difficult for a general theory to make the link with uh, what we may say concrete cases. I have said that because I also ceded to the temptation in a talk in which I cannot see the people to, to, to provide uh, um, an example. But it is not because, it's not because there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the theory and those cases, because there's also a difficulty in, in, in understanding what we see. The point of my example with the soy case is that it is not difficult to, to go against the basic foundations of the theory we are using. It is not that power is just a, it's an anomaly that can be fought. Or it is not that inequality, uh, a given distribution of incomes is an anomaly. That, if you don't like it, it's an anomaly that can be reduced. Uh, there are rules in the system and those rules are expressed in, in terms of the general theory. Thanks, Sakundo. Uh, so I'm gonna ask a question now. I don't see other questions. So let me um, ask people if they have other questions, please um, add them. So Facundo, I think what you presented, I mean, at least in my mind, it would be possible to separate two arguments, which are clearly related, but which I think may be separable is my question. So one is the need for a general theory. Uh, and the resumption of this political economy project that you say ended in the 19th century and needs to return and to replace or at least complement the sort of, you know, multiplicity of little models and, and, and things that we have in, in, uh, in neoclassical economics. Uh, that's one argument. And the other one is the differentiation of capital. And, I, you know, I think you relate them because I think you say that's you know, that's how you move from the abstract to the concrete political economy in your diagram. But let me ask you sort of, so question one is whether this is right, what I've just said in your, in your whether it's right in the sense that I understand you right. Two, two other uh, sort of sub questions. One on the differentiation of capital. You know, we, we, we've, people have written models with different kinds of capital. Um, uh, physical and human, for example, but even within physical, uh, private and public capital, which are modeled as imperfect substitutes. So to what extent differentiating between certain kinds of capital in the sense that they um, are imperfect substitutes, right, uh, in the production of something, uh, why does why would that require such a dramatic departure? You know, my question is: Can we not differentiate capital by extending uh, a fairly standard approach to production functions, and then people can own different kinds of capital and therefore uh, have different kinds of income that arise from them, and they can be remunerated at different rates? Uh, and, uh, and to the extent that there's different competition in the ownership of those forms of capital, uh, they may or may, ha may or may not have, you know, different degrees of market power. So, so I'm saying that may not be such a big departure, uh, is, uh, is one question. And let me, let me stop there because I do see some other questions coming in. I, I had one on the general theory as well, but, but let me stop with that if you, if you'd like to answer that and then I'll go to the other questions. But the two questions are related. In a sense, for me, for my framework, are the same. Yeah. And I challenge you and anybody to contradict this statement. All the capital in all the models we know developed in the 20, since 1900, all the models, no matter how you call capital, in human capital, it doesn't matter that all those capitals are qualitatively equal and behind the conceptually and behind them there is always the tendency for the profits for the rates of profits to equalize 
you only have the equalization of the rates of profit in the context of a general theory if your capitals can compete, no matter how different they are for your application's purposes. But conceptually, they are all the same. And it is a strong argument, it's a strong statement to say, as I am saying, that Marx, even Marx, had that idea in mind. The, the differentiation of capital you see, or you want to name differentiation, is not the one I'm saying. For what all, all the differentiations you see are the same capital. They, are, they, they have some differences, but they all compete. And in competition, they play the rules by the rules of the game, and their fate is the equalization of the rates of profit. If you don't see the equalization of the rates of profit in real life, the theory will say, well, it's a fact, there are some anomalies, but the theory is the theory. But it is true that that capital is an illusion of theory two and theory one, in a sense. Capital is not that. In capital, there is a hierarchy connected with the capability of innovation. But there are some, there is some a fraction of capital that can always systematically attract a, um, a higher rate of profit, a surplus rate. This is part of the theory of the differentiation of capital. When you move from capital which are qualitatively equal to capitals which are quant qualitatively different, you leave the world of the equalization of the rates of profit. And the theory, the, the previous theory stumbles down. The, the previous theory stumbles down. Uh, we should forget about that assumption. And in, uh, I, I know I'm not being clear, but all our, all our um, uh, discussions in, in inequality and in the distribution of assets have behind this idea of the equalization of the rates of profit. Uh, you want to distribute capital in a way because it's just quantitatively equal, qualitatively equal. Uh, it dominates us. I mean, it, we need, I, I said like the, for the first time, like I am saying, perhaps it's shocking or it's not clear, it is obvious, but it is not. It's at the roots of the theory with which we think. Do not assume and do not impose the equalization of the rates of profit for us. I cannot hear you. Sorry, sorry, I was on mute. Thanks, thanks for that answer. Let me uh, get some more questions here. Juan Palomino has asked two, which I'll put together, and then I'll also um, read one from Julia Russo. And uh, those may be the last two that you will have time to answer. So Juan Palomino asked, are the qualitative differences you point out in capital based on some capital producing more returns in terms of conventional wealth and another in terms of power? Or is there something else you mean by that? And then continuing the previous question, what are the implications of those different capital types existing, similar to what Chico said? Uh, so that's one, that's one Palomino. And then the second one from Julia Russo. First of all, thank you, Professor, for the insightful lecture, really food for thought. My question is, may this reasoning allow us to refresh some of the arguments of Burnham about the difference between control and ownership of capital in his The Managerial Revolution in the faraway 1920s? Does it make any sense to take back some elements of such a distinction, which I guess is the distinction between control and ownership. Thank you very much. Um, um, capital has, I mean, let, let's, make, yeah, some, let's make a distinction between the theory and uh, life. Capital has always been differentiated. This is, uh, this, is, this is the beauty of the theory. Now that I can say capital is differentiated, theory three understands that it was a mistake or it was a necessary moment of the analysis, the analysis of the system with undifferentiated capital, as it was a necessary moment of the analysis, the study of the markets with individuals considered to be equal, who they are not, what they are not, because capitals are not equal either, 
capital has always been differentiated. If you want to put example, historical examples, you take, for example, colonial capital. Colonial capital with the state behind is a kind of differentiation of capital. Colonial capital arriving to the, to the new world uh, is, is a, it's a kind of differentiation. It's, it's a kind of external differentiation. But now what we see, what something that Smith couldn't see, Ricardo couldn't see, and even Marx couldn't see, is what we, I would like to call, and in the framework we call, in the framework we call the intrinsic differentiation of capital. It is in the nature of the concept of capital to be differentiated. This differentiation is linked now, it is more, it, is, it should be quite evident now, is with the appropriation and the production of innovation. When I say this, I fear in just a short talk and a short lecture that you are interpreting all my words from neoclassical, uh, with neoclassical eyes. And why? Because neoclassical doctrine sees all this. Of course, neoclassical thinking sees capital and sees differentiation and sees different rates of profits and sees monopolies, but it doesn't have a general theory to explain all that. It is Again, it, it, those are misfunctioning of the system. Another thing for neoclassical theory, capital is undifferentiated. Another thing is to say when the, we are in another theory where the nature of capital is to be differentiated and where power stems from capital. I, be, I, I can be very brutal now. When you say that the concept of capital includes the concept of power, you cannot have the state outside anymore. The state, which is part of your power, is now inside the system and you cannot take it as to be outside and being the sphere of common good, uh, which will tend capital and force the development. But, but this, this is, a, I cannot synthesize in, in two seconds or in two minutes or in one sentence of the, the 200 years of political, um, political philosophy thinking. Um, and the, the, the second question, I don't know if I remember, well, I, I, I will tell you something. I, 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 I won't talk about particular authors today. I, will, I, made, me, I made a commitment not to, to make this a presentation about individual thinking, but about general thinking. But I can tell you, no, I mean, the, conceptually, Conceptually, and this is sad and this is good at the same time. Conceptually, the development of the concept of capital reached a limit in the 19th century, and we are there. This is very sad. This is very, very sad. We, if there is a concept of capital that has to be the past, as the French say, the passé, is Marx's concept of capital. We need to start from there. Marx didn't have a concept of undifferentiated capital. This is the thing we, Levin has developed and we are thinking to further development. But the most developed concept of capital we have is Marx's concept of capital. The rest, no, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, uh, I'm sorry that it is difficult to talk uh, simply about this. The 20th century has been extremely fruitful in the development of instrumental innovation, but conceptually, Conceptually, in economic terms, we are in the 19th century. That was the limit. That's the limit of the second theory. Uh, you want it or not, you like it or not. Uh, and uh, uh, will this be useful for generating policy recommendations or not? This is another thing. I mean, this, uh, this idea of the policy recommendations is, is, is a separate matter. We are. The, Marx has showed up the path and the limit. It's his, his own limit, and we need to build from that point onwards. Uh, we, it's it would be, I, I, I don't want to be unfair, but uh, this is one of the reasons, uh, the, the lack of conceptual progress in the 20th century and the first 20 years of the 21st century is, has as a result the, the state in which we are in economic terms. Theoretically, Thank you very, theoretical, of course. Thank you very much, Facundo. I did get one more question from Wilfred Altsinger, but unfortunately we 
don't have time for it. I've already been told by my, my bosses here that I must wrap up. So I'll ask Dr. Altzinger to please address the question to Facundo by email. Um, and it remains for me just to thank Facundo very much for this very thought provoking sort of unusual uh, talk, which was really, really very thought provoking. Um, and uh, and uh, to thank all of you for joining us uh, as well. And, and finally to welcome Facundo once again uh, to the International Inequalities Institute. So thanks a lot Facundo. <laughs>